quick. Just to... Don't worry, I already cured the pumpkin. Mmm. <laughs> so, I, I how do we feel? Do we feel good about pre and post processing? No? Well, then what questions do we have? Did um, everything before um, like pre processing has to go through the ADC first, right? Like all that happens? So, not necessarily. ADC is responsible for, for part of pre processing, right? ADC. So, does everything have to go through the ADC? Um, does all pre processing happen in the ADC? So, the answer is no. Some of the pre processing happens in the ADC. Right, quantization, creation of the histogram, that is part of the ADC. But once we have the histogram, it gets to the computer. The computer is going to do the rest of the stuff, right? The computer is going to do automatic rescaling. The computer is going to do flat field correction. The computer is going to do dead pixel correction. And then the computer is going to show you the image. Okay? So ADC is part of pre processing, but it's not the whole story. Anything else? Yes? For the flat field correction, mm -hmm. so it's basically saying that when the <laughs> x-rays expose the image detector, mm -hmm. they're, because of like whatever, it's not going to be uniform mm -hmm. per se, because it's not like perfect. Mm -hmm. So basically this flat field correction changes it to where it is one uniform thing. Correct. Okay. <coughs> Very good. Okay. Yes, Tom. What was that post-processing? What did you said yesterday that the senior said it didn't really? Uh, yes. Uh, so smoothing? you are electronic cropping, you're masking. What is that? What is cropping? What is masking? It's decreasing the field. Decreasing the field of view, right. So it's post collimation, right? It's when your tech goes to the screen and drags the little rectangles around the anatomy that they use a 14 by 17 on, even though it was a hand, right? Post collimation, cropping, masking. Another term for that is also called shuttering because it's like you're using the shutters, the nut shutters, the collimator, but after the fact. So you've got all these different names for the same process, the same idea, which is changing the field of view after you have the image. Shuttering, masking, cropping, post collimation all of these mean the same thing. Will you see all these different terms? Yes, you will. So don't let that confuse you. Just know that they all refer to the same thing. Right? Different nicknames for the same person. Anything else? Can you go over the dead pixel correction? Like, I didn't understand. Um, dead pixel correction, that so. So it's like a piece that is not the same color as the surrounding. Correct. Pieces, right? And why is it not the same color? That's why I didn't understand. Because it's not functioning. Right, so you have a detector, your Dell, your Dell isn't working, it's not picking up x rays, that's why it's a different color. And so we just need to work around it. You can't go in and fix the one single delt because it's so small. So the computer just says, all right, you know what, forget it. I'll just guess what the color is. That's dead pixel correction. Okay. Um, so when you're on like, yeah, sorry. when you're on portables and you take like any extra, <coughs> um, a lot of times the tech might increase like the contrast or the brightness. Mm -hmm. um, I think you were saying that like, if they do those things and they send the image, mm -hmm. like from that image, it can't be changed, right? Or like, and that's why you should leave it how it is so the radiologist can change it? That's close. Mm -hmm. So if you change the image either on the portable screen or on your monitor, on your console, before sending it, what happens is you will send your corrected data you will send the changed data across, and now there's no way to retrieve the original data. Okay. Now, the radiologists can still change the appearance on their own screens, yeah. but they're not working with the original data anymore. So you've given them something that doesn't quite accurately represent the patient. So would it 
be better to not change anything and just send it? So generally speaking, it would be better to not change anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then at the same time, like if they are like changing it, mm -hmm. like what is their thought process of doing so? It's embarrassing to send a faculty image to radiologist. Okay. And like 90% of the time, the radiologist may not notice that you've changed it. Right, 99.9% right? .9 of the time, they won't notice, right? But it's always that 0.1% of like edge scenario that you want to be careful of. One situation where the patient's diagnosis could change based on your windowing. So just play it safe and don't do it. Good. All right. So if there's no more questions, let's talk about exposure indicators. And this is something we discussed last semester as well, right? We talked about S values last semester, if you remember that. So exposure indicators, these are used in digital imaging systems to indicate the level of radiation exposure to the IR. So it tells us, did we overexpose or did we underexpose? Why is this information so much important on DR? On why, or it's like CR and DR, like digital, digital radiography. Why isn't this so important in film screen? Why do we need an exposure indicator in digital and not film screen? In film screen, you can't like adjust it, right? Right, first of all, in film screen, you cannot adjust it. Which means that what you shot is what you get. You can visually tell if it's overexposed or underexposed, just based off appearance. But for digital imaging, what pre-processing occurs that changes the look of your image? Automatic rescaling. Your images are automatically rescaled. So it doesn't matter if your image was underexposed or overexposed, when it pops up on the screen, your image usually looks the same. So you have no feedback as to what your exposure was like, other than do I see a little bit of motto, or, well, you can't tell if the patient was overexposed, right? You can't tell that on the image. So it's important that we have exposure indicators so we know if we used too much technique or too little technique, right? Because you can't actually see it visually on a digital image. So. If we were to want to, if we were to change exposure, right? If our exposure indicators were off, what technical factor, right? What setting on the control panel would you change? That's not change. KVP. KVP. Yeah. Mass. Well, those are the two main things on the control panel. So, if we're talking about exposure, exposure. What is another word for exposure? So, so quantity, yes, quantity. Exposure is about quantity. And so related to quantity is, Charo? Mass. mass, very good. Mass is the controlling factor of quantity. So mass should be your controlling factor for exposure. So if you want to change exposure, first thing you should change is the mass. KVP, remember, controls your quality. So KVP controls your contrast more than it controls your exposure. So you would change mass if your values are off. That should be your first thing that you do. Wait, can you quickly go back? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of different exposure indicators. And that's because we have a lot of different vendors, right? Each company has its own form of exposure indicator. So. For example, Fuji, Konica, they use S value, sensitivity value, or S number. It could be called either one. CareStream, Siemens, they use exposure index, EI. And this EI is directly proportional to the exposure, to the dose. Philips also uses EI, which is exposure index. But theirs is inversely proportional to exposure and dose. So it acts a lot more like S value. And then we have Agfa, which uses log M, or log medium. So this is an L, right? Not an I, but this is an L. 
Um, I think earlier I caught this log mean last semester, mm -hmm. but when I went back to look at the um, outside material, everything else caught as log median. So I think that your book has it slightly off. So different vendors have different exposure indices. So it's important you know what an exposure index means. When you work, they will tell you, this is the number you should be shooting for. Right? So they'll tell you an exposure index of 1,400 is good. You want your EI to be 1,400. So you're like, all right, 1,400. You shoot an X-ray, it's 700. You're like, oh no, I'm too low. But what do I need to do to my exposure to change this exposure index? If I raise my exposure, what's going to happen to the number? If I lower the exposure, what's going to happen to the number? And it's not so easy as if exposure goes up, the number goes up. It works like that if it is a direct measure of exposure. But if it is an inverse measure of exposure, exposure goes up, number goes down. Right? So you need to be careful of which way your exposure index will move. So when you're in clinic, when you're in the outside clinics, when you're working with CR, when you're doing this with Fujifilm detectors, Fujifilm IR readers, they use S value. S value is inverse. It's opposite. If we actually look at this diagram over here, right, about S value, if your S is low, you are overexposed. If your S is high, you are actually underexposed, right? So here's your proper S. We'll say the proper S is 200 for a chest X-ray. If your S is too low, you actually use too much. If your S is high, you actually use too little. So you would need to move it in the opposite direction. Does that make sense? And this isn't only affected by mass, right? This is, could also be affected by SID. Mm -hmm. So things like SID, mm -hmm can also affect your exposure. So like shooting something at 70 or 72 mm -hmm. versus 40 would give you a number like 300 instead of like 50. So if you increased your SID, right, your exposure is going down because of inverse square law. Mm -hmm. And so if you're doing S value, then yes, your S value would go up because now you're underexposing. Okay. So how do you um, fix that underexposure? Well, if your SID is supposed to be 72, right? You don't want to change it to fix your exposure. So what do you change? Mass. If you're underexposed, you raise your mass. If you're overexposed, you lower your mass. It's that simple. Anytime you change exposure, first thing to change is mass. So far, so good? So far, Just remember, inverse, things move opposite directions. Direct things move the same direction. So S value, inverse, log median, direct. EI, it can be direct, it can be inverse depending on which company it is. So that's kind of annoying. So Philips is the only one that's inverse? Correct. Philips is the only one with an inverse EI. S value is also inverse. So these are the two inverses. Hmm. Why do you think that is? No. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's the same problem in MRI. MRI has vendors that are all doing the same thing, but they give everything a different name, and it's just really frustrating. It's mm -hmm. theirs. Exactly. The company's like, this is my thing. I'm not sharing my name with anyone. But the other company's well, then in that case, this is my thing, and I'm not sharing the name with anyone. And you end up with five names for the same simple thing. Right. Oh, can you go back, please? Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you ever want to know why multiple things have, or one thing has multiple names, the problem is something because some company somewhere wanted to make their thing sound special. Absolutely. So remember, these are CR exposure indicators. Okay, this is for CR only right now. 
There is value. Now, the best value is CR only. Right? Log medium, <coughs> CR only. Let's see. Let's see. Thank you. So let's move to digital. What kind of exposure indicators do we have for digital systems? DR. Index. Mm -hmm. So that's right. We have exposure index. Now, older products may use DAP. DAP stands for Dose Area Product. If you take that word and you break it down, dose is how much dose a patient receives. Mm -hmm. What are the units of dose, absorbed dose? Graves, very good. Area, an area is just what? The area is space. space. Right, the space, an area. So how do you measure area? Length, 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 size. length width. Good, length, length, width. So what kind of units would you use for area? Meters, centimeters. Great, so length would be meters or centimeters. So meters times meters is? Meters squared. Meters squared. And so that has units of grays times meters squared. That makes sense, right? You work that out yourselves. The centigrade times meter squared. Not per, not per meter squared, but centigrade times meter squared. Because you're multiplying by the area. That's older, right? So this is older products, although some older products have never been updated, so they still use DAP. <laughs> now here's the problem with DAP. DAP measures dose. What kind of dose? Absorbed dose. Absorbed where? In the patient. This tells you exposure to the patient. This doesn't actually tell you exposure to the detector. So this isn't actually a good exposure indicator. It only tells you what's happening to the patient, but not actually to the detector, to the IR. So the better thing to use is still the exposure index, the EI. Now, some machines, instead of the EI, will give you a deviation index, a DI. And you may have seen this, for example, at Bentov Bone Clinic, because there, they don't really give you a number. They have this kind of like light, and it like turns green or yellow, depending on like how far you go in the different directions. And it tells you like plus one, plus two, or plus three. So that is called deviation. How far are you away from where you want to be? Do you need to memorize this equation? Mm -hmm. No, you do not. <laughs> so, this equation is just here for you to see what's going on. You do not need to memorize this. Do you need to memorize this over here? No. Nope. <laughs> just the bolded parts, please. Uh -huh. right. What parts? The bolded ones. The bold underlined, the things that scream very important, right? Make sure you at least know those. So, so this is this is logarithmic math? This is logarithmic, yes. So if your deviation index is plus three, that means your exposure was two times too high. Right? If your deviation index is minus three, that means your exposure was half too low. Right? So if your exposure index, sorry, if your deviation index is minus three, guess what you have to do to the math? You have to increase it, sir, because this is the mass. Mm -hmm. so right. Increase. Exposure was too low, so you have to bump up the mass. By how much? Two times. Well, this is half, right? right? Uh, so to get back to normal, you need to go up. Half. By times two, right? So you need to double your mass. Right? Your, your mass was half, half the value it should have been. If the mass was half the value it should have been, that's why the exposure was half the value it should have been double your mass. If the DI is plus three, what do you think needs to happen to your mass? Drop it down. By how much? By half. Right, the exposure is double, right? So if the exposure is double, your mass is double, you bring it back down to normal. How do you get rid of that double? You half it, right? Bring it back down to normal. So. Right? If the DI is plus three, mass should be cut in half, and vice versa. Does that make sense? So if it's negative three, you multiply Right, so if it's negative three, you, have, you do not have enough mass. So you need to multiply your mass by two. Mm -hmm. 
So you, just remember, you're always doing something by two here. It's either you're multiplying by two or dividing by two. How do you know which way to go? If you're that by three, you just go down by two. That's right. If you're too high, you just do what makes it smaller. If you're too low, just do whatever makes it bigger. Yes, Jay. Um, I know you said the formula doesn't really matter, mm -hmm. but uh, the T stands for what again? Mm -hmm. Great question. So the T here is the expected exposure index. Right, so this is your target, right? Target, That's what okay. you're aiming to get. So if these perfectly line up, then your DI is gonna be zero. That means you have zero deviation. You're perfectly on point. So what so actual exposure index over the target, right? Correct. Can you go back there you go? I think he sent us these two. He did, but I don't think I read for now. No, you can. So if it's plus three, divide your mass by two. Yeah, I'll get that double version. Multiply your mass by two. Very good. So when we see DI, it's all, always going to be either one, two, or three, or are there higher numbers? You could get higher numbers, but then that'll mean your exposure is way, way off. off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would it be better just to reshoot that image then? Oh, you definitely would. Uh, I mean, if you're way off like that. Right? I mean, it depends on your image, right? If you super overexpose your patient, is it worth it to reshoot the patient? Probably. Well, it depends on your image. If your image still looks fine, then please don't. There's no point at that rate. But if you completely burn off the image and you can't see anything, then yes, you would need to reshoot. Do you have any examples of images that like were way over or yes. underexposed that so, still got sent? Oh, still got sent? No. But I can tell you a situation where you would need to reshoot. If you set up for a chest X-ray, okay, so you set up for a chest X-ray, except you leave your AEC detector on the table. Now, we haven't talked about AEC, so I'll give you a really brief explanation. AEC detects radiation. It, like, okay, I got enough X-rays, I'm gonna stop your exposure. It basically determines your exposure time for you. If you aim your X-rays at a wall, and it's expecting x-rays on the table, you're gonna be shooting x-rays at the patient at the wall, while the table EC is like, I'm waiting for these x-rays. When are these x-rays gonna get here? I'm gonna just keep shooting x-rays until x-rays arrive. Once I see enough x-rays, then I'll stop this. Whoa. So you're gonna be blasting the patient, and you're gonna get a very overexposed image. And so at that point, yes, you would definitely need to reshoot. But I thought, I thought rooms can't fire with two detectors in the in place at once. So you're not putting two detectors in place, you just have the wrong setting selected. Oh, okay. Yes? Is that for like old school a machine? Because the new ones don't shoot if they're not aligned perfectly to the wall, but you're capable of it. So newer machines do have safeguards in place, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, I guess, depending on how things are set up, there might be some edge scenario where you can still make it happen. So there's other safeguards as well. It's not gonna shoot forever. We do have ways to make it stop, but yes. Those are situations where I've seen this happen, mm -hmm. where you need to reshoot due to overexposure. You've seen them? Mm -hmm. yep. So you were the tech? Mm -hmm. yeah. he, 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 was, he was a student. <laughs> he trapped himself. He was a student. He trapped himself. Yes, yes. I, I have done that before. <laughs> I have done that before. So, Context right? clues. So it was an accident. Because I just done an abdomen, I was setting up for a chest, got everything set up, yes. forgot to switch the setting over, and then I got a black image in place. <laughs> there was also been times when I got a white image. Um, doing portables. Um, so this was right, so this is back when I was a new tech. I was still, I think in my first year, I got caught to do a shock room. It was like a chest and a pelvis. So I set up for the chest x-ray, had the patient up, right, did their chest, they laid them down, or split the cassette over, got my pelvis, pelvis ended up white, I'm like, why is there no image here? They did it again, it's like, bam, still no image. Damn, all right. you did it twice. And then I was, so it's the third time, and I'm just sitting there thinking like, all right, what's going on? Nurse walks by behind me, and it's like, hey, isn't the tube supposed to be pointing at the patient? Oh <laughs> my. Amy did that one time, and I was just like, what's Yep. 
So it happens, right? But new tech, <laughs> rushing, right? It happens. So it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. The thing is that you I'm learn from those sure. mistakes. <laughs> and you can be, you can bet that I never made yeah, that yeah. mistake again. <laughs> so, uh, how, yes. where was the tube aiming then? If you weren't aiming at the pelvis? Um, it was still aimed like a chest. At the chest? Yeah, still aimed like a chest. <laughs> so I just laid the patient down and moved the IR, but I forgot to. Research the <laughs> poor patient, dude. Patient just oh standing there, like the two putting it like past her head, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. No, I wasn't aiming at your face, right? They were like laying flat, so like the tubes pointing up this angle, and the patient's like down here, so it's like aiming at the back wall. So, but, so, so at least, but even then, but yeah, they still got the wall, getting all of it. Exactly. exactly. So. Okay. No radiation hit the plate at all, right? You said the plate right, was white. Right. That's white. That's white. Okay. So. Their pelvis is fine, I guess. Okay, so now let's talk about spatial resolution. Something else that we also discussed <laughs> back at the end of last semester. Right, so we're going to have a few more fancy vocabulary words here. Number one is Nyquist frequency. All right, Nyquist frequency is very simple. Your anatomy has a certain frequency. By that, what I mean is the smallest structure of your anatomy is going to be like the wavelength that we're looking at, right? And as you learned with Ms. Bonilla, wavelength and frequency are related, right? They're inverse. Yeah. So your anatomy has a certain size, and that size can be described as a frequency because it's just the inverse of the wavelength. What we can sample, what we can see in the image Right? What determines our spatial resolution is our ability to detect small frequencies or detect high frequencies. Right? So if something is really small, small wavelength, high frequency, inverse, right? So we need to be able to detect high frequency. However, we can only detect frequencies up to a certain level. We can't detect super, super, super high frequencies. So that limits our spatial resolution. So the upper bound of our frequency, the highest frequency that we can accurately record is the Nyquist frequency. That's all that means, the highest frequency we can record accurately. Okay. With, based on what we can sample. So if I know the frequency I can sample, then I know the frequency of the anatomy that I can see. If I try to measure something with a higher frequency, then I'm capable of recording, I end up with aliasing. I end up with artifacts in the image. Okay. So there are two ways. Yes, go ahead. Um, so you said the smallest anatomy is the wavelength? Mm -hmm. Right, so the size of the smallest anatomy, right? Uh -huh. You can describe that as a wavelength. Okay. Right? And so you take that wavelength, and the inverse is the frequency. So for example, let's say that you've got that anatomy popping up multiple times. Mm -hmm. Like for example, you know how like the ribs are like black, white, black, white, black, white, right? So there's the size of the ribs, right? Let's say that's your wavelength. So inverse that and that's how often they pop up. That's your frequency, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So what is the highest frequency we can measure? These ribs are spaced pretty far apart. So that's a low frequency. They don't show up that often. But what if you have something smaller in the body, right? So what if you have like renal stones, right? Calcifications in the kidney. And the stones are small. Are you able to see the separate stones or do they all look the same? What determines that is if the frequency of those stones, so the size, their wavelength, their frequency, if the frequency of those stones is low enough to be detected by our is low enough to fall into our Nyquist frequency. If the frequency is too high on the stones, then we're not going to be able to properly see them. Okay, so if the stones are too small, the wavelength is too short, the frequency is too high, we can't see the stones. The maximum frequency we can see is the Nyquist frequency. Maximum or the minimum? Maximum. We cannot see things beyond the Nyquist frequency. If you try, you end up with something that's not accurately represented. Spatial, uh, sorry, 
Two objects really, really close together. Are you able to see them as separate, or do they look like the same object? So two objects close together have a certain frequency. It's going to be a really high frequency. Are we able to see this, or is the frequency so high it just merges them together? And so we have two ways of talking about spatial resolution, LSR and MTF. Limiting spatial resolution, modulation transfer function. These should look kind of similar to last semester. Right. Oh, by the way, what do I mean by not being able to see frequencies? So you see over here how you can clearly see these frequencies, mm -hmm. right? And so this looks normal. You look over here, right? Our ability to look at the frequencies is lower. So I can't see such high frequencies in this image. Right, so this is an image where I can see high frequencies. This is an image where I can not see high frequencies. But I have the same anatomy. So now, because I can't see the frequencies that are that high, notice what happened to my image here. Do you see how it becomes distorted? Do you see how it actually looks? It does not represent what is actually there. Right? So if you can't see the Nyquist if you are trying to see something beyond the Nyquist frequency, if you're trying to look at something that's beyond your ability to resolve, you end up with something that does not accurately represent anatomy. Okay. So, does this over here look kind of familiar? Yeah. Our line here. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, our line pairs, right? One white, one black. Mm -hmm. Remember, it is a pair, yeah. so the pair includes both of them, right? Not just one, a pair is both of them. So limiting spatial resolution. This describes the smallest object you can see with your system, right? So the spatial resolution, right? What is the limit of your spatial resolution, right? The smallest object. If it's smaller than that, you can't see it. It's beyond the limit. You see it's the smallest object you see? Correct, so LSR, the smallest object that you can see with the system. All right? And so we measured this using this bar pattern, using these line pairs. Now, there is a problem with LSR. The problem is it depends on the person looking at it mm. and what they're looking at it on, right? For example, Go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah. Um, right? For example, right, if I'm standing here, right, and I'm looking at this, I can still tell these apart, even all the way down here at 3.4, right? However, if Mr. Fung does this, suddenly Mr. Fung can't see that. Mr. Fung can maybe see this one, but Mr. Fung can't see this one. So LSR depends on, for example, who's looking at it. Some people can see higher resolutions than others. It depends on what you're looking at it on, right? It depends on the monitor, right? If the monitor is poor quality, you're not gonna be able to see things as detailed. If the monitor is higher quality, then you can see things further down. So LSR does not tell you only about the image, right? It's influenced by other factors as well. So LSR is a good basic way to describe spatial resolution, but you can't use it to compare images across multiple things because things change. The variables, the environment changes in between them. So is there a different method to talk about spatial resolution that does not depend on the person or the contrast or the display or the exposure? And the answer is, MTF. Oops, sorry. MTF. Okay. So it's all right. Maybe forgot I added that slide to my phone. Ta da! <laughs> <laughs> this is the real. updated one, right? This, um, this should be in the updated one, yes. Okay. Wow. So, bar patterns, right? 
High resolution, low resolution, right? Clearly different, right? Hard to, right? Now it's hard to see where one starts and one stops. So, MTF, modulation transfer function. This is another way for us to talk about spatial resolution, but it doesn't depend on how good you are at reading bar patterns. So, how to describe this? This one's a little bit tricky to talk about. Mm -hmm. To be honest, you don't need to know this in such high detail, but I'll try and, so I'm gonna try and give you kind of the overhead summary of it. Like we said earlier, the signal is made of waves, right? So anatomy has frequency, the signal that we get out of it, right, is made of waves, right? We have our analog signal, which is nice smooth waves, we have our digital signal, which is the choppy, discrete waves. Right? But the signal is still made out of waves. Low frequency waves, right? So big wavelength, low frequency, right? Those are large structures. Then we said high frequency, right? Small wavelength, those are small structures. Now what we find happens is that as the frequency of the structures increases, the amplitude decreases. Right? And as you learned with Ms. Bonilla, amplitude is the height of your wave, right? And the height represents the strength of your signal. So what happens is that if you have high MTF, high spatial resolution, even as the frequency of your signal increases and you get to smaller and smaller structures, the amplitude remains high. So that's high spatial resolution. This computer system is able to see small objects because even when the frequency is high, the amplitude is still really high. It's still really good. On the other hand, here we see something that's a bit more realistic. As the frequency increases, the amplitude, the height of these waves, is decreasing. Do you see that? And so, as the amplitude decreases, we are losing contrast, which means that our spatial resolution is now no longer as good. So high spatial resolution versus low spatial resolution. Right, so it's all just about what's happening to those waves in the signal. So this means that the MTF changes with the frequency. As the frequency increases, we see that the MTF, the percentage right, of our amplitude, begins to decrease, begins to drop. High, if the higher frequencies can maintain high MTF, then we have good spatial resolution. If they can't, then we have bad spatial resolution. Right, so it's, but that's kind of like your general overhead overview of MTF. It's just a way to look at the signal, which is the waves, look at the strength of the signal, and compare it to the frequency, the size of the object. The higher the frequency, the smaller the object, the higher your percentage, the better your spatial resolution. So the higher your frequency, right? So higher frequency means smaller object. Right? So if you go up to these higher frequencies, look, you're looking at smaller objects. Mm -hmm. And then you look at your MTF. If you still have a high MTF at those high frequencies, mm -hmm. that means good spatial resolution. If you have low T MTF at that frequency, you have poor spatial resolution. So for this graph, is this what it normally looks like then? Mm -hmm. Correct. So like when it gets to that, higher frequency, like the MTF-10, mm -hmm. like it's most likely not going to have great spatial resolution. Correct. Okay. Right. And so we also saw right same graph over here as well, right? Oh, okay. Right. Well, once again, frequencies on the x-axis, MTF on the y-axis, right, as a percentage or as a fraction. So is there a way to get a better MTF? on something that high um, frequency or no? So it would just, 
the await would probably end up having to upgrade the system. Okay. If you're talking about physically. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the kind of detector, the kind of computer, the kind of same thing. Okay. Yes. Where, where is MTF like in, in the processor? Or? So MTF is just a way to describe the image. So it's not a it's not some sort of machine. It's not an object. It is just if we want to describe the spatial resolution of an image, what tools do we have to talk about spatial resolution? So it's just a way for us to compare things. It's kind not of like thing. how when you buy a refrigerator, right? You look at how much energy does it use? How quickly does it cool things, right? So you have all these factors, right? MTF is just a factor dealing with the image. Right? So with the image, it's like, how is the contrast? How is the spatial resolution, right? How do you describe this? One way is by using MTF. Yes, John. No, I was just saying it's not a physical thing. Correct, it is not a physical thing. How do you see the frequency? So this would just be something that you would sort of experimentally derive, right? So that's how they have like these data points here. Right, so they do it. So they collect the signal. Right, so when we collect the signal, we can see the frequency of the signal because we have the waves. So we know what the frequency is like, and then we just take a look at the amplitudes of those waves. Now, if you want to know how we're able to find the individual waves of the signal, that is a much more advanced topic. We use something <laughs> called the Fourier transform, which is another fun thing we deal with in MRI. So if you really want to know about it, <laughs> so if you really want to know about how signals work like this, come join MRI. We'll talk about, about signals in more detail than you care about. You just scared everybody off. Wow. Yeah, they did it. So. <laughs> All right. I didn't want to let him write anyway. That's for real. Uh, right now, <laughs> that's what he was thinking. Right now it's 118. Let's take a short break. All right, so if you want to join me, stretch. Otherwise, just, well, what does this? Ha <laughs> ha